stopped. My testimony highlighted the dismal state of electronic record keeping at that time across nearly all agencies in the federal government. Unfortunately, the situation has not improved in the intervening six months. Two years ago, after conducting an online survey submitted to more than 400 agency records managers, my organization, CREW, reported that the vast majority of agencies failed to take advantage of existing technology to preserve their electronic records, and that even knowledgeable agency employees lack a basic understanding of their record-keeping response obligations. NARA's more recent self-assessments confirm these results and reveal, as we've heard today, the extremely troubling statistic that 79% of agencies face a moderate or high risk of improperly destroying their records. Examples abound of the widespread problems within the federal government in managing and preserving its electronic records. Our litigation against the Executive Office of the President and NARA brought to light a wealth of evidence of the continuing and systemic failure of the Bush White House to preserve and manage its emails. In a recently released port, report, EOP, EOP documented the fact the Bush White House archiving system failed to capture 89.4% of the universe of known emails for 21 non-consecutive days that a president failed to preserve nearly 90% of some of the most his valuable historical documents is both shocking and completely unacceptable. As a frequent requester under the FOIA, crew often confronts an agency's inability to locate responsive email records. The Veterans Affairs, for example, recently explained to us its failure to locate a key email was due to the practice of the agency to store its emails on backup tapes that periodically were recycled, even in the face of a pending FOIA request or FOIA lawsuit. While these persistent problems present great challenges, we believe Congress can provide a solution through legislative amendments to the Federal Records Act and the Presidential Records Act. And my written testimony outlines some of our proposals in that regard. But I would note that the Federal Records Act carves out an enforcement role for the Attorney General because the archivist no sway over whether and how the Attorney General exercises that authority. And I think the Department of Justice's handling of the apparently missing emails of former OLC official John Yu illustrates the problem with the existing statutory scheme. In July 2009, the Office of Professional Responsibility issued a report of its investigation into the role Mr. Yu played in the development of the so-called torture memos. That report made public in February of this year notes explicitly the investigation was hampered by the disappearance of all of Mr. Yu's emails. Almost immediately, NARA asked DOJ to investigate and report back to it, and Crew sent a letter to Attorney General Holder also requesting an investigation. Four months later, DOJ has yet to respond to either request and the public and Congress are no closer to learning the truth about how and why emails central to an investigation of critical public importance are missing. Clearly, there is something wrong with the law that says the public must sit by idly while agency heads, including the Attorney General, refuse to act. Nearly 20 years ago, while an attorney at the Department of Justice I engaged in a vigorous internal debate over whether email was even a record that had to be preserved with all of its metadata. Today, this issue is long settled as a matter of law, but as a matter of practice, agencies continue to treat emails as readily discardable, even while their value has grown exponentially. Just look at the currency Elena Kagan's federal and presidential electronic records have as Congress evaluates her nomination for the Supreme Court. Simply stated, emails are the gold we mine for an answer to questions that perplex and worry us or the truth behind an administration's or agency's controversial decisions and actions. Yet we fail to handle these treasures with care. Congress must act to ensure our past will be available for future generations to study and learn from. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Wiseman. And uh, we will go to the question and answer period. I recognize the uh, ranking member for North Carolina. Ms. Wiseman, uh, I appreciate your testimony. There was a, in your written testimony, you have uh, a recommendation for how we can actually ensure that the president 
is required to keep the data that he's required to keep, right? And I, I appreciate it, what you're saying. I, I think you're, uh, you make very valid points about the last administration, about uh, their lack of transparency. Um, and uh, my question to you is, uh, what can we put in place now so that doesn't happen again? Well, this is where I think you can consider amendments to both the Federal Records Act and the Presidential Records Act. I mean, in part through our litigation, the White House now has in place what is an effective record-keeping system. But this has been a problem that has plagued us through many presidencies, and we have no assurance, especially as technology changes, that the next president will be out of compliance once again. And that's why we think it's imperative that at a minimum you give the archivist some oversight and responsibility to at least ensure that the president has in place an appropriate system. I understand and appreciate the constitutional problems with dictating to the president what he or she must save and cannot save specifically, but I don't think you come close to those problems if, you, if you're trying to just enforce the responsibility that they have a system in place. So that means enhancing the archivist's role Yes. At present, the archivist basically has no role while a president is in office. Aside from outside groups, who is the cop here to ensure that these records are kept? Uh, there really is no cop, and that's part of the problem. So it falls to outside groups? It fa well, it, it, even for outside groups, there's no role because the courts have held that, with some limited exceptions, the, the, because the statute doesn't really spell out a role for outside groups, that there's no, uh, we have no ability essentially to sue. Now we had, you know, there are some limited exceptions, but if you have a president who completely ignores his responsibilities, I think it would fall to Congress through legislation to correct the situation. Is this a systemic issue that is made worse by different administrations, but at root is this a systemic issue throughout the federal government? Yes, it's a systemic issue throughout the government without question, and I think this leads to our second point as, as to why we need some legislative fixes to the Federal Records Act, because the roles and responsibilities that the archivist has, even in that arena, I think are still limited. And I think the best example of that is the fact that this critical self-assessments, the archivist really has no legal way to compel agencies to comply. And in that arena as well, the courts have recognized very limited roles for outside groups like mine. So there too, we are in favor of expanding private rights of action. But we also think that you can beef up the administrative enforcement mechanisms um, for under the Federal Records Act that will give the archivist greater authority. Would you be willing to submit your recommendations to this committee? Absolutely. I, I certainly appreciate uh, hearing those. Uh, do you think our, our, presidential, uh, our presidential library system as constructed now makes it more difficult for you to retrieve those records uh, going back years? I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons why they are difficult to retrieve. I mean, I think too often each presidential library tends to operate as an individual fiefdom. And I, I also think you have problems with the state of records be, that vary dramatically between administrations. I mean, I think if we can get to a place where we are system, systematizing, if that's a word, both what presidents are creating and how we're preserving them and what agencies, we will overcome that battle. Absolutely. And that goes right into, Dr. Hunter, your, your definition of a, a record. Basically, the federal government is using the 1950s definition when the rest of society is using uh, a much more updated version. Is that the federal definition actually is that the same one that most states use. Most states adopted the federal definition. The private sector doesn't have to. Many private sector organizations use a very similar definition, but in the world of digital record keeping, there are others who are looking at it saying that we're spending more time trying to slice something very thin that may not be worth the effort, that we have to manage it anyway, especially if we're in a, in a discovery environment. We have to find it no matter what it's called. So therefore, perhaps we need to look at the fundamental and, and try to, to minimize that sorting and, and uh, slicing and dicing that isn't really building, uh, giving us much advantage. How far behind do you think the, f the federal government is in uh, keeping records compared to the private sector, compared to private institutions? Well, if we were doing this in front of some private sector people, they would be saying the federal government may be ahead of where they are. I, really? I think my point is that this is very difficult. Uh, how would you say that? I mean, uh, is it 
in terms of the technology the federal government yeah uses and or is it the policies or is it the people what would what, what yep, is my, the advantage uh, this is very difficult work and as I say in the written testimony this is a line responsibility so some private sector organizations have been able to push that responsibility in the same way that human resources policies people are accountable for complying with that fiscal policies there are cops to use your word who make certain that frontline managers comply with those policies if those same cops are able to say are you complying with the records management policy so in some ways, in some private sector areas with compliance, uh, they've been able to do better. There are some private sector areas that would just would love to be able to, to have, uh, from the previous panel, to have uh, an organization like the Department of Defense to push for its business purposes, a standard with the full package at, that then becomes adopted otherwise. So this is just very difficult work that must succeed as an individual line responsibility and it's harder in the federal government perhaps because it's a there are more people with that responsibility thank you and thank you for your testimony appreciate it thank you mr mchenry uh, dr hunter i found your uh, example of the indiana university archives uh, working on an electronic record study uh, with an NHPRC grant interesting. Uh, we continue to be amazed by the scope and importance of, of this vital program. Uh, you mentioned that you do not think NARA should conduct audit reviews. Can you explain why not? Uh, NARA, I believe, certainly has the responsibility and should do audits, but uh, all day long I've been hearing the question of is, is NARA as an entity and in the private sector, we have the same issue. Is the records management department, when it says you're not following orders, do they have the clout? Are they the cop to force a change in practice? And perhaps one solution legislatively is to make NARA a bigger sheriff in this, to give them more authority. Another potential solution would be to look at the other sheriffs who are there with the other line responsibilities and see perhaps a strategic partnership uh, might be the more cost-effective way to go. So certainly I don't think NARA, uh, NARA needs to be, has the responsibility, but uh, I'm asking uh, all parties to consider what might be the best cost-effective way to discharge that responsibility. Thank you for that response. Can you uh, please elaborate on the role of records liaisons and how you recommend agencies can be encouraged to utilize them? Records liaison very often, again, uh, at the grassroots level as opposed to the agency head level, uh, there, there needs to be someone in every office who knows what's going on with the records and needs to be empowered to do what's right and efficient with those records. Sometimes those people are well trained and they're enthusiastic and other times they're people who uh, someone may think they have some more time on their hands and so they can do this as well. But again, that responsibility for that key role at the department level, this will break down unless uh, the people are properly trained, but there also is a system of accountability that in the human resources environment that the job descriptions reflect this responsibility, that they're evaluated on it, that their manager in turn is evaluated on what they do. So uh, that's why I talk about this as being hard work. At some point, it does get down to the level of who is the records liaison, the person responsible for the digital system or the paper-based system. Do they know what they're doing, and are they rewarded for taking the initiative and doing it right, or does, does no one even notice that? Thank you for that response. Ms. Brock, your impression of records liaisons? Traditionally. Traditionally, records liaison officers are at too low level to make a difference. What we really need is information management officers, um, professionals who understand the scope, breadth, and depth of the mission and the opportunities there. How can uh, federal agencies use ARMA International's principles-based approach, uh, use, using generally accepted record-keeping principles uh, to improve their records management program? Chairman Clay, thank you for asking me that. There are basic competencies in these principles, accountability, transparency, integrity, protection, compliance, availability, retention, and disposition. And we have five different levels of compliance with each. We could use this as a scorecard for judging programs and for what they should be aiming to achieve for compliance. 
I also see that we can use these principles to design our training, to actually build up our programs, and to monitor and direct how we conduct our procurements for these tools to handle our records. Thank you for that response. Let me ask uh, Ms. Wiesman, uh, what specific amendments to the, to the Federal Records Act do you recommend to expand the uh, archivist's oversight and enforcement responsibilities? Well, I think, first of all, they need to be given the authority and, re and clear responsibility to conduct themselves an investigation when they have evidence that there's been a violation of the Record Act. Um, I think, as, we out, as I outlined in my testimony, the next step would be not only to make that public, but when they find such evidence, we would recommend that they make a referral, that it be mandated a referral to the agency inspector general. And I think this is addressing in part something Dr. Hunter ha said about looping in others. There already is within each agency an inspector general that has authority to conduct, you know, investigations and has experience with that. Um, and I think that the findings of that should be made public. And again, this is where we think if the agency still chooses to do nothing in the face of evidence of a problem, that there should be a private right of action. Um, you know, we have listened very carefully over the years to NARA's view on its authority, for example, and responsibility to conduct investigations. Crew actually brought a lawsuit against NARA a year or so ago based on their failure since 2000 to conduct investigations of agencies. And we dropped our lawsuit after we met with them and they outlined for us their plan to do the self-assessments and a multi-phase plan that also includes um, inspections of agencies. But, and, and we are truly heartened by um, the renewed vigor that Dr. Ferriero is trying to bring to NARA and I think he really is committed to these principles. But the problem is that we've seen an ARA under other archivists that's taken a very passive role and a very passive view of what its responsibilities are. So we think it's really critical that the responsibility and obligation, as well as the authority to oversee agencies, has to be made explicit in the legislation. And, and I certainly appreciate what you're saying. They need to have, uh, we need to bolster their authority exactly. through, through, uh, through, through laws. Um, out of curiosity, uh, how would you, would you uh, treat the Federal Election Commission records and the candidate filings the same as all other federal records or do you see a, a need for uh, some type of um, special treatment there? I don't think there's any need for special treatment. I think, and I, and I recognize the sort of complexities in relying on a definition of what's a record and what isn't, but in large extent, within the federal government, it, each agency is going to decide what's a record based on its central mission. And I think there's already enough within the law itself to cover what entities like the Federal Election Commission should be preserving. So I don't necessarily see a basis for special treatment. I think it's more an issue of compliance. Okay. Thank you very much. And then we will now go to the, the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Mrs. Norton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I do think this is a very important hearing. I regret that I was unable to be here for the, the, its beginning and have, not, and have only come to hear part, been able to come to hear part of um, what our second panel has had to say. I must say first that I really think that the government's responsibility for record-keeping uh, record differs markedly from the private sector. The private sector shreds. The private sector wants to get rid of a lot of stuff, uh, especially if they think we're coming. But actually, it's, it's efficient for them to get rid of a great deal of what they have, and they are at pains to do it. Uh, they, of course, have to have some records, and they figure out, because it's an expense to keep records, you probably are better at figuring out which ones to keep and which ones not to keep, given the, given, uh, the expense associated with it. Um, the federal government, on the other hand, has a, um, a governmental responsibility to maintain records that others would consider trivial. Uh, and somebody's got to decide where that line gets drawn. Um, this is often the, the history of important events are hidden in very small 
and uh, seem seemingly trivial uh, communications. I was impressed by the figures provided us before this hearing that almost 80% of agencies are either at high or moderate risk of improper destruction of records. That's very scary, the word destruction. Um, so that brought me to uh, an interest I've had in the role, growing role of emails. So there's some people who, some agencies um, like uh, those uh, in the private sector communicate almost exclusively through emails. Um, it is becoming for often here as elsewhere the central mode of communication. Uh, are there special challenges that are unique to email? In, in record keeping by government? Ms. Brock or anyone else? Yes, ma'am, there are special challenges in managing email. Yeah. Email has many components um, that can be hard to capture as a group. They, um, it's very hard to tell whether an email is a record or is not. For example, in GAO's report um, 08742, on National Archives and Selected Agencies Need to Strengthen Email Management, they include this wonderful flowchart on whether or not it's an email. And it starts with, is it a record? And it ends with, if in doubt, ask your records officer. Now, if we each had one of these stickers on our computer, we'd go crazy. But it does give us a flowchart for determining record status. We do indeed conduct our entire lives on email. And the separation between reference, record, and personal correspondence is also very fuzzy. Somebody's got to figure it out so there's some uniformity here. Uh, not, of course, these agencies are very different. and You would not expect absolute dis uh, uniformity, but you've got to have some baseline to begin with as new, new uh, forms of communication emerge. God help us when Twittering becomes a major <laughs> mode of communication. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Norton. Uh, ha ha having no other questions, um, that will conclude this hearing. The hearing is adjourned.